Welcome to the Estates Made Simple podcast with myself, Gordon Vanderleek, and my co-host, Jenna Carvalho. Uh, we are on a mission to simplify the world of estate administration and ensure executors have the right tools to do the job. Um, we're talking about some important issues, but want to put a disclaimer at the front end to say this doesn't constitute legal advice. It's We're providing hopefully some helpful information uh, for our listeners and viewers. Um, but if you have any specific questions, contact us and um, there's no implication um, of establishing uh, a formal relationship that would require a retainer uh, by virtue of publishing this podcast. So with those legal things aside, let's talk about today's topic, uh, Jenna, about what assets make up an estate. Well, thank you, Gordon. Nice to chat with you today. Um, This is a question that we get quite often is, is what actually is an estate? What does that mean? Um, An estate is essentially all your assets that are left to deal with in accordance with your will when you pass away. So that would be, you know, your financial assets, your real property, your digital assets. Uh, It could even include your artwork hanging on the wall, um, genetic material that you have frozen for future use. So anything that you own um, would need to be dealt with. Now, some assets pass outside of your estate by way of either a beneficiary designation or a joint holder status. Um, but anything that's not passing outside your estate would be part of your estate and your will would direct where those assets are distributed um, upon your death. And uh, and so this is an important topic and I, uh, I'm excited about it. So um, I'll let you, uh, Gordon, review what assets pass outside of the estate for our listeners here. Yeah, and I think maybe if I were giving a seminar, what I've what I would do at this point is probably have a slide that had a picture of two buckets because it's a nice visual. So for our listeners, if you can visualize um, two buckets in some complicated estate, there might actually be a third or a fourth or a fifth bucket. But for simplicity purposes for this discussion, let's consider two buckets that I'm going to call inside the estate and outside the estate. Right? What's in, what's out. From an estate administration perspective, if I'm doing an intake, I'm trying to determine, well, what actually are we listing in the inventory of the deceased? Uh, that's the new um, phraseology with the new GA forms is is the inventory. But if you think of it, it's kind of like a business's inventory. Well, what what is on the shelves, if you will, of a business? But in the context here, well, what's in the house? What's at the bank? What do you, everything that, um, you know, we look at all the assets that are attached to that person's name, like if their name is on a bank statement, if their name is on a client card, on a credit card, um, that's going to give you a clue of what is inside and outside the the estate. So the first big one, um, like a a big asset, I think that a lot of people have would be their home, right? That's where they have their equity, they're paying that down, and, and they may pass away owning real estate if, if, if they're not renting. And and typically, if you're looking at a couple situations, there would that would be held in joint name. So that's an example of something which has a right of survivorship. That means it automatically passes as a matter of law to the other owner, the joint owner, um, automatically on death. So therefore, it would not be included in that inventory of the estate. It would, in fact, um, pass. All joint assets would pass by right of survivorship. But there's also an area for different registered accounts. So um, the main ones, again, there can be more than just these two, but these would be the main ones would be an RSP, um, it's a registered retirement savings plan or a RIF, um, um, as well as a tax-free savings account. So those are the two registered accounts where, in fact, the there can be a designated beneficiary. Another example that isn't a registered account would be a life insurance. So those are kind of the three main ones for most people, life insurance, RSP or RIF, tax-free savings account, where you can designate somebody to receive the proceeds from that um, account or from that policy to receive them as a result of death. Of course, people may have property in a family trust, they may have a corporation, um, but in that circumstance, there um, there has to be that analysis of what is inside the estate and what is outside the estate. 
All right, now that we've reviewed what has happened uh, or what passes outside of the estate, uh, let's review what's inside the estate. Uh, what does the executor have to manage? What are the assets that the executor has to uh, manage? And that if there is a will, would be governed by the will or the rules on intestacy. So Jenna, maybe let's uh, let's have you cover that that topic. Yes, thanks, Gordon. Um, so, you know, as a rule of thumb, anything that Gordon didn't mention of what's passing outside the estate would be part of your estate. Um, so that could include accounts, non-registered accounts in your name solely. So it doesn't have a joint holder. Um, that would be part of your estate. It, it could also include real property owned by you, um, or you could own it with somebody else as tenants in common. So you might own a percentage interest. Um, rather than a joint ownership with uh, with real property. So if you own a percentage interest in a real property, that percentage typically flows into your estate to be dealt with in accordance with your will. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, you know, anything in your name could include vehicles, personal property, um, digital assets. I know those are tricky to find sometimes, but digital assets would it would be included. And then uh, and then you know anything that you don't have attached to another, another member of your family or another joint owner um, would be part of your estate. And, and you know, it's important to, to really distinguish these two buckets, as you mentioned, because they're dealt with differently. And sometimes you get confused of how your will disperse, disperses assets and what's passing outside of your estate. And, and to make sure that your beneficiaries are kept equal um, and, and the way you want them to be, um, you know, treated, it, Consider all of your assets as one bucket, but then determine what's appropriate and how to deal with them, whether through your estate or outside your estate. And, and I think, Gordon, you're going to touch on some best practices um, with respect to dealing with those assets. And I think with that, you want to be, if you're looking at it from a planning perspective, um, if, if you're asking the question, what happens to my stuff when I pass away? You both have to look at what's inside the estate and what's outside the estate, right? Where is it going to flow? Sometimes I might, I've, I've dubbed this kind of a flow analysis, right? If we're doing things in advance um, for somebody when they're doing their planning um, and asking the question, where are things going to go? So I think for, I, I just, I think it's a really important point to review. Um, and it's important for executors to determine, well, what are they controlling and what are they not controlling? So looking at it from that perspective, if there's an asset out there um, and they just make an assumption that, well, that's going as a, for a beneficiary designation, that could create some problems because they're not taking control of that asset and protecting it, right, when they when they should have. So they really, uh, the best practice would be no, leave no stone unturned in terms of figuring out what's out there. Hopefully there's a good list that comes um, with the will, uh, you know, in the filing cabinet that their records are organized, but sometimes you just have to, you you have to go through and, and figure that out. So don't make any assumptions. You have to make inquiries. Uh, the tricky thing is before you get a grant to probate is convincing the bank to give you the information so you mm -hmm. can fill out the probate application form in this inventory. But under the current rules, um, you can you you've got six months in which to file an updated inventory. So sometimes what happens is you just put in a to be determined or a general estimate, and there is an opportunity after you get the grant to probate, and you can maybe get more accurate information. Uh, then you are able to update your filings with the court, so you have an accurate rendition of what did the person um, die owning. But from the perspective of planning. Uh, certainly you want to review your beneficiary designations and and make sure that accords with your wishes, right? That things are going to the right people. If, you know, otherwise there's going to be a fight about that. And that could lead to some estate litigation, which is going to tie up the administration of the estate. If you have three kids, but you're leaving an insurance policy to one of the children, well, is the expectation that person has to share that? Or that's just for them exclusively to the exclusion of their siblings? Well, if you don't do that clearly, now you've left um, a situation where the, um, you know, the estate administration is rife with conflict and 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 different opinions about the deceased person's intention, and that's when people lawyer up and end up in court, and that could be a difficult a difficult situation. So you want to make sure at the end of the day, it's about from a planning perspective, it's what your wishes are. 
uh, but just finding out what's there. So start with finding out what is the beneficiary designation. We see situations, and some of these have even, with more famous people, ended up in the news, where, um, you know, an example might be you start an RSP when you're young, and then later on in life you find your soulmate and you get married or you're living in a in a committed relationship, and the intent is you want all those funds to go to that person who you are doing life with, but it turns out the beneficiary was probably like that person's mom or dad or sibling, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so the intent is, hey, honey, you get everything when I die, but maybe that doesn't happen, right? Uh, we're, we're dealing with those cases regularly and uh, that's just gonna uh, lead to problems in the estate. So the best practice would be do what you want with your stuff, but make sure it's clear. And if you don't know, find out if you have a financial advisor, they should be able to tell you, go to the bank, go to your financial advisor and say, give me a copy of the beneficiary designation. I can't remember who I designated. Um, and, and if you can't answer the question and you don't have a record of it, go get the record or just get the beneficiary designation form and, and fill it in. If the intent is it's gonna go directly and part of the strategy is maybe avoiding probate, we've seen situations when RSPs turn into RIFs Mm -hmm. that the bank hasn't carried forward the beneficiary designation. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what's accepted practice with all the banks, but I've certainly seen it that there's a missed expectation that they thought it was going to go directly, but now it's payable to the estate. And again, you may say, well, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem in a situation of what if there's litigation, right? I mean, what if the reason the person died is because they were in a car accident and it was their fault, and now there's litigation that ties up the estate? It makes a big difference to the plaintiff's lawyer, um, whether that's inside or outside the estate, right? right. So even making sure things go directly, um, you kind of, it, it, it's a workaround uh, to the probate process. There may be some specific creditor objectives, creditor protection objectives you want to achieve. So the idea would be get some advice on it, but just find out first what actually is there and does that match up to your wishes? The other thing I would say um, is, the other problem with the R with RSP, so best practices would be, particularly with the RSP, if you intend that to go to a spouse or partner, you get a rollover. If it goes right. to a kid or anybody else, a charity, now that all gets included in income, you're going to have higher tax in the estate. So there's a tax savings benefit of making sure it's going the right the right place, and that's where planning your estate, if you are like in a blended family situation, you want some money to go to kids and you want some money to go to a spouse or partner um, that is not the mother or father of your children, then in that situation, we could do some planning to make sure the registered investments roll over to the surviving spouse or partner and maybe other assets like insurance go directly to the kids. So it's it's important to figure out for executors what they're controlling and they have an obligation to control it from a planning perspective, you don't want an unintended result um, mm -hmm. on, on that. So you, you definitely have to look at both um, both of, of those. So you wanna make sure they match your wishes, which presumably is 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 what is laid out in the, in the will. If you have children with long-term disabilities or a family member, we gotta be careful about having money go directly to them um, outside the estate. Maybe we want it to be part of a trust. So whenever you're doing trust planning, we want to make sure that's inside the estate and um, ensure that it's captured by or the executor controls it and it can be handed over to the trustees of that trust so it's properly properly managed. If somebody's on age, there's an implication to receiving an inheritance directly. So that has to be part of the planning, the planning process. Um, but I guess my last point would be what you talked about earlier is be mindful of the tax consequence. Um, we've had uh, certainly, um, doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen where RSP funds go in one direction and the estate ends up with the tax bill, right? Right. Um, that could all be well and good if that's what was intended. Um, but it, it, it's important to know where that, where that money is going to go, uh, because the, the estate has to include that as 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 income. And I think in our next episode, we're going to be talking about the tax consequences of dying. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit more. But but with we're talking about assets that are in or out of outside of the estate, just understanding your RIF or your um your your RSP or your RIF, um, there's an implication of who receives it. 
not so with the tax-free savings account. There's no implication there, but there is for some registered investments. So you just want to be mindful of that. And where it lands at the for the executor is they um, they may not control that asset, but they got to pay the bill associated with it. So that affects the residual beneficiaries. And if that's different than who's named on the beneficiary designation, um, you know, then then you know that's going to be the reality in that estate. Mm -hmm. unless there's a court order to fix it or some other unique circumstances, right? So in my example earlier, mom and dad might get the RSP. It's not going to the surviving spouse, but the tax bill associated with that, because it's all included in the final tax return for the, for that deceased person affects what the spouse or partner ends up with. Yeah. Right? So it's a double whammy. It may not go to the right place, but the tax associated with the collapse of that registered investment, the RSP, the RIF, um, would lessen the amount of money available for a spouse or partner, which again, yeah. may not be the intent. And everyone goes, well, that's not what the person wanted, but that may be reality. Right? And so I think, you know, a good summary to, to you know, complete what you're saying is sounds complicated, get some good advice. <laughs> you know, and the reality, yes, I, I, I concur. Um, but the other thing to say is that some of these solutions are pretty easy, right? Mm -hmm. It's just... If you're not sure, fill out a new beneficiary designation form, right? Yeah. If the bank or your advisor can't give you a solid answer, we'll just do a new one and then problem solved, right? And then your wishes will get carried out. And, and really, it's about being clear on that with your executors so they know what to manage and how to disperse. Another way of saying that is if your will has a certain plan of distribution, that may not include all your assets. I guess that's the uptake of this, right? That that the executor only controls that which is inside the estate, in that bucket that we called inside the estate. Um, and it may be just fine that other stuff is going outside of the estate. And if it's going to a spouse or partner and your will says everything to a spouse or partner, it's the same result. But it can make a difference if there's a lawsuit, it can make a difference, um, you know, if, if, um, there's a different distribution. Um, yeah, and, and so for those reasons, I think you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that it's easy to fix from a planning perspective. From an estate administration perspective, it becomes relevant of what does the executor control um, and and how, um, you know, is that is that what the person wanted? Right. And and I also like to add too that the planning um, considerations is much different in other provinces than it is in Alberta. Um, so often people try to avoid probate, passing assets directly outside of the estate. But again, it, as we mentioned in earlier episodes, it's it's not as imperative um, in Alberta with low low probate fees. Um, so that's something to consider for for our listeners and. And as you mentioned, our next episode will be based on the tax consequences at death. Um, what we need to pay. Is there estate taxes? What does CRA uh, want from us? And so I'm looking forward to that conversation no, with you, Gordon. Yes, no one likes to pay taxes. But no. The, your estate has to pay taxes as well. So I think it's a timely uh, topic to think about how can we minimize that from a planning perspective, but also what, what are the obligations of the executor and their responsibilities to make sure that that gets uh, carried forward. So tax permeates everything, including estates. So I think that'll be a good topic uh, to, to cover. Um, so I look forward to that. But hopefully um, the takeaway here is, is from if you're looking at it from your own personal perspective, um, think about what you have and, and what do your beneficiary designations say. Get current on that and then that'll form a conversation with an advisor as to do we, do we need to change that. Um, if you're an executor, it makes it clear as to what you control and and what you and what you don't. So thanks. This has been a good good conversation, and we look forward to our our next chat about death and taxes. Yes, thank you, Gordon, and thanks to our listeners. Um, please subscribe on on your favorite podcast uh, avenue, and uh, and thank you for your support. We'll see you next time. 